My Lords, with the Leave of the House, I will now repeat a statement made by my Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State, for exiting the European Union. The statement is as follows. Mr Speaker, I will now update the House on the two rounds of negotiations with the EU, which took place in July and August. While at times these negotiations have been tough, it is clear that we have made concrete progress on many of the most important issues. I would like to thank all our officials who have been working hard at home, as well as out in Brussels, to make this happen. Colleagues will have received my letter following the July negotiating round dated 9th of August. I set out the dynamics of that round in some detail. These rounds were not at this stage about establishing jointly agreed legal text. Rather, they were about reaching a detailed understanding of each side's position, understanding where there might be room for compromise and beginning to drill down into technical detail on a number of issues. During both rounds, discussions took place on all four areas including these specific issues relating to the rights of citizens on both sides, Northern Ireland and Ireland, the question of a financial settlement, and a number of technical separation issues. I will speak briefly about each in turn. Making progress on citizens' rights has been an area of focus for both negotiation rounds, and we took significant steps forward in both July and August. We have published a joint technical paper which sets out our respective positions in more detail, updated during or following the August round. This underlines both the significant alignment between our positions and also provides clarity on areas where we have not yet reached agreement. In July, we reached a high degree of convergence on the scope of our proposals on residence and social security, the eligibility criteria for those who will benefit from residence rights under the scope of the withdrawal agreement, and a shared commitment to make the citizens' application process as efficient and streamlined as possible. In August, we agreed to protect the rights of frontier workers, to cover future social security contributions for those citizens covered by the withdrawal agreement, to maintain the right of British citizens in the EU27 to set up and manage a business within their member state of residence and vice versa, and that we should protect existing healthcare rights and arrangements for EU27 citizens in the UK and UK nationals in the EU. These are the European Health Insurance or EHIC arrangements. These areas of agreement are good news. They may sound technical, but they matter enormously to individuals. The agreement on healthcare rights, for example, will mean that British pensioners living in the EU will continue to have their healthcare arrangements protected both where they live and when they travel to another member state, where they will still be able to use an EHIP card. On mutual recognition of qualifications, we have made progress in protecting the recognition of qualifications for British citizens resident in the EU27 and EU27 citizens in the UK. In fact, each one of these areas of agreement is reciprocal. They will work for Brits in the EU and the EU27 in the UK. These areas of agreement help provide certainty and clarity for EU27 citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the EU27. They will make a tangible difference to these people's lives. I hope everyone recognises the importance of that. The outcomes of these discussions demonstrate that we have delivered on our commitment to put citizens first and to give them as much certainty as early as possible in this process. Of course, there remain areas of difference which we continue to work on. For example, we will need to have further discussions on the specified cut-off date, on future family reunion, and on the broader issue of compliance on enforcement. Progress on these areas, areas will require flexibility and pragmatism from both sides. During the summer negotiating rounds, a number of issues emerged in the EU offer that will need further consideration. For example, 
The EU does not plan to maintain the existing voting rights for UK nationals living in the EU. We have made it clear that we will stand ready to protect the rights of EU nationals living in the UK to stand and vote in municipal elections. Similarly, the EU proposals would not allow UK citizens currently resident in the EU to retain their rights if they move within the EU. Even in areas where there has been progress, more is needed. While the EU has agreed to recognise the qualifications of UK citizens resident in the EU and vice versa, we believe this should go further. This recognition must extend to students who are currently studying for a qualification. It must apply to onward movement by UK citizens in the EU and it should extend more broadly to protect the livelihoods of thousands of people which depend on qualifications which will be gained before we exit the EU. In these areas, the EU's proposals fall short of ensuring UK citizens in the, EU, in the EU and EU citizens in the UK can continue to live their lives broadly as they do now. On separation issues, a very technical area, we have established a number of subgroups. They made progress in a number of specific areas and drew on papers the UK published ahead of both rounds. I'm pleased to say that we are close to agreement on our approach to post-exit privileges and immunities, on which we have published a position paper which will benefit both the UK and EU to maintain after we leave. We have agreed on our mutual approach to confidentiality agreements on shared information post-exit. With respect to nuclear materials and safeguards, we held discussions on the need to resolve issues around the ownership of special fissile material and the responsibility for radioactive waste and spent fuel held both here and there. We reiterated a strong mutual interest in ensuring that the UK and Euratom community continue to work closely together in the future as part of comprehensive new partnership. With respect to legal cases pending before the Court of Justice of the European <coughs> Union, the parties discussed and made progress on the cut-off points for cases being defined as pending. There was also progress in discussions concerning the UK's role before the Court, whilst these pending cases are being heard. With respect to judicial cooperation in civil and commercial matters, and ongoing judicial cooperation in criminal matters, we made good progress on the principles of approach and the joint aim of providing legal certainty and avoiding unnecessary disruption to courts, businesses and families. With respect to goods on the market, both parties reiterated the importance of providing legal certainty to businesses and consumers across the EU and the UK at the point of departure. We held discussions on the principles of an agreement and agreed that further exploration was needed of how these objectives would be achieved. In this area in particular, we emphasise that the broader principles outlined in the UK's position paper seek to minimise the type of uncertainty and disruption for business which we're all working to avoid. <clears throat> We remain committed to making as much progress as possible on those issues that are solely related to our withdrawal. But our discussions this week have exposed yet again that the UK's approach is substantially more flexible and pragmatic than that of the EU, as it avoids unnecessary disruption for British businesses and consumers. I have urged the EU to be more imaginative and flexible in their approach to withdrawal on this point. On Northern Ireland and Ireland, I'm pleased to report there has been significant concrete progress in this vital area. The negotiation coordinators explored a number of issues, including both the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement and the Common Travel Area. In August, the group also held detailed discussions 
on the basis of the UK position paper. As both I and Michel Barnier said at last week's press conference, there is a high degree of convergence on these key issues, and we agreed to work up shared principles on the common travel area. That is quite a major change. We also agreed to carry out further joint technical work on cross-border cooperation under the Belfast Agreement. Of course, as I've said all along, the key issues in relation to cross-border economic cooperation and energy will need to form an integral part of discussion on the UK's future relationship with the EU. Finally, on the financial settlement, we have been clear that the UK and the EU will have financial obligations to each other that will survive our exit from the EU. In July, the Commission set out the EU position. We have a duty to our taxpayers to interrogate that position rigorously. That is what we did, line by line. That may have been a shock, but that's what we did. At the August round, we set out our analysis of the EU's position. We also had in in-depth discussions on the European Investment Bank and other off-budget issues. It's clear that the two sides have a very different legal stances. But as we said in the Article 50 letter, the settlement should be in accordance with the law and in the spirit of the UK's continuing partnership with the EU. Michel Barnier and I agreed that we do not anticipate making incremental progress on the final shape of the financial deal in every round. Generally, we should not underestimate the usefulness of the process so far. But it is also clear that there are still significant differences to be bridged in this sector. Initial discussions, discussions were also held on governance and dispute resolution. These provided an opportunity to build a better shared understanding of the need for a reliable means of enforcing the withdrawal agreement and resolving any disputes that might arise under it. Alongside the negotiations, we have also published a number of papers which set out our thinking regarding our future deep and special partnership with the EU. These future partnership papers are different from our papers that set out our position for the negotiations over our withdrawal agreement. Our future partnership papers are part of a concerted effort to pragmatically drive the progress we all want to see. All along, we have argued that talks around our withdrawal cannot be treated in isolation from the future partnership we want. We can only resolve some of the issues with an eye on how the new partnership between us will work in the future. For example, on Northern Ireland, it would be helpful to our shared objectives on avoiding a hard border to be able to begin discussions on how future customs arrangements will work. Furthermore, if we agree the comprehensive free trade agreement we are seeking as part of our future partnership, solutions in Northern Ireland are, of course, easier to deliver. A second example is on financial matters. As we have said, the days of making vast contributions every year to the EU budget will end when we leave. But there may be programmes that the UK wants to consider participating in as part of the new partnership we seek. Naturally, we need to work out which of these we might want to pursue. We need to discuss them as part of the talks both on our withdrawal from the EU and our future as their long-standing friend and closest neighbour. A third example is on wider separation issues. While we're happy to negotiate and make progress on the separation issues, it is our long-term aim that ultimately many of these arrangements will not be necessary. With the clock ticking, it would not be in either of our interests to run aspects of the negotiations twice. Last week, as we turned our consideration to the next round of talks, my message to the Commission was, let us continue to work together constructively to put people above process. To that end, my team will publish further papers in the coming weeks, 
continuing to set out our ambition for these negotiations and the new deep and special partnership the UK wants to build with the EU. Ultimately, businesses and citizens on both sides want us to move swiftly on to discussing our future partnership, and we want that to happen after the European Council in October, if possible. As colleagues know, at the start of these negotiations, both sides agreed that the aim was to make progress on four key areas. Citizens' rights, the financial settlement, Northern Ireland and Ireland, and broader separation issues. We have been doing just that. I will not pretend that it's always easy or simple. I've always said this negotiation will be tough, complex, and at times confrontational. So it has proved. But we must not lose sight of our overarching aim, to build a deep and special new partnership with our closest neighbours and allies, whilst also building a truly global Britain that can forge new relationships with fast-growing economies around the world. Um, may I thank the noble lady, the, the Minister, for repeating the, the statement and, and, in fact, welcome her back from what's been a busy summer, I think, for her, but as nothing to what's <coughs> to come over the next 18 months. Um, while any progress, however limited, is welcome uh, with regard to EU citizens, how much better it would have been that the government heeded our call 12 months ago made clear our commitment to those living here and got down to the details at that stage rather than just recently. The matter does need to be resolved urgently. The overall statement, however, more broadly, is rather like a piece of lace, trying to protect the government's modesty but with rather more gaps than fabric. Indeed, at times over the summer, and our office very kindly sent me the future uh, partnership papers, I did wonder whether these rather bland, almost non-papers, really did represent the true extent of the government's thinking, or simply the very least they dare get away with, without waking the slumbering Rhys Mogg. <coughs> because what is clear, and what the mood music from Brussels and across the capitals, indeed, tells us. And just yesterday, the Irish Foreign, Foreign Minister was saying that the Secretary of State's plan for the Irish border needs a lot more work, and that unless there is progress on that issue, we're not going to get to phase two. What is clear in that general mood from Brussels and across the capital is that it's very unlikely that the EU will decide in October that sufficient progress has been made to move on to the all-important talks on our future relationship with the EU, our nearest and largest market. So whilst David Davis remains, claims he remains optimistic that a seamless trade deal can be struck with the EU, Michel Barnier speaks of no decisive progress and that frictionless trade is not possible outside the single market and the customs union. And even the government is unclear on how trade outside a customs union could be fri frictionless, dropping after just a few weeks its untested blue sky thinking for, uh, sounding more psychedelic to me, but uh, uh, its blue sky thinking for a track and trace system using technology and trust to replace customs controls. And anyway, we understand that the IT for any new customs checks is not anticipated until January 2019, and we all know about government procurement of that size, just two months before our supposed departure day. Looking beyond the EU, Liam Fox now seems to be saying he's turning down free trade deals because we don't have the capacity to negotiate them. And instead, we should try and duplicate the EU's trade relationship, relations with third countries, a sort of rollover of existing deals or a cut and paste job, hardly worth the efforts, I would have thought, of a Fox negotiator, who now, of course, is without his minister here in the Lords. In January, the Secretary of State claimed to be aiming for a comprehensive free trade agreement and a comprehensive customs agreement 
that will deliver the exact same benefits as we currently have. So could the noble, noble lady, the minister, let us have the government's current thinking on this? And could she also tell us where we are on a transitional agreement? And whether the words she's just used about no, not having to negotiate twice suggests that the transitional agreement will indeed be on the same terms as now. Because I hope that she and her colleagues have now finally come to accept that there can't be a bespoke transitional agreement. There'll be no way to, time to negotiate that. And the sensible thing is to remain in a customs union with the EU and operate single market rules which are key to our vital industries while the long-term relationship is agreed and given time to bed in. And could the noble lady, the minister, also tell the House whether the government will publish the Treasury's analysis, which reportedly shows that the economic benefits of future free trade agreements will be less than the economic costs of leaving the customs union and the single market? Could the noble lady, the minister, also update the House on the involvement of the devolved authorities. The JMC, which brings together the Scottish, Welsh and, in theory, the Northern Ireland governments, hasn't met since February and it won't convene again until mid-October. There's been no substantial response to the joint letters of the 14th and the 23rd of June from the relevant ministers, Mark Drakeford and Mike Russell. And despite the terms of reference, to that JMC committee to seek an, to agree a UK approach to Article 50 negotiations and to provide oversight of negotiations with the EU. In fact, the government published its summer papers with absolutely no consultation and very little advance warning. So that means that the Scottish and the Welsh governments have had no opportunity to provide any oversight of the negotiations. My Lord, the clock is ticking. Industry, farmers, supermarkets, airlines, road haulage, lawyers, accountants, they're all coming to me. I'm sure they're going to the government as well. And they are all concerned about the lack of clarity and certainty. Whilst consumer representatives are getting virtually no access to ministers and fear their interests are being overlooked. My Lords, it is not just the EU which has to decide whether sufficient progress has been made. This House and Parliament must do so too, and question whether the direction as well as the speed of the government's thinking is up to the task ahead. I fear that this statement offers little reassurance. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, I also thank the noble lady minister for repeating the statement. I'm afraid that the government has been showing itself to be insufficiently prepared and at times even undisciplined and undignified in throwing insults at Brussels. It has rather squandered the 14 months since the referendum, including an unnecessary court battle to prevent parliamentary accountability and three months on an unnecessary general election. There have been some steps forward, publication of the position papers, uh, uh, is uh, useful, uh, albeit in recess and given to the media several hours before available to uh, members of the public, including parliamentarians. The acceptance of a transitional uh, period, though without specifying how long the government wants that to be, and no acceptance of whether that would mean in the customs union and the single market. Like the noble lady, I was intrigued by the reference in the statement to it would not be in either of our interests to run aspects of the negotiations twice. As I understand it, unless the Minister can contradict, contradict me, uh, the only way I can see that happening is if we stay in the customs union and the single market in the transitional period and in the long term. There has also been some progress on EU uh, citizens. There have uh, there, there has been an acceptance of some role for the uh, European Court of Justice. In July, there was an acceptance of uh, financial obligations from commitments made while we're a member state. Uh, these, however, were all inevitable and would have been better if they hadn't had to be dragged out of the government. But there are still 
uh, several impractical red lines, and I think there have been some rather backward steps. The Home Office has sent letters to a, a significant number of EU nationals threatening them with immediate deportation, which hardly um, uh, makes for good mood music for the negotiations, apart from uh, being obviously very distressing for those individuals. We've had a repeat from the Prime Minister of the no deal is better than a bad deal mantra, which we had hoped had been put to bed. There was an agreement, an acceptance of the sequencing of the uh, talks, but now that that is being put up in the air again by the government. Uh, we understood the government had accepted the principle of the uh, liabilities, the financial liabilities, but now all that is also being challenged. And I think this fickleness and lack of reliability is fomenting some distrust of the government. It makes it much harder for the EU to agree a linkage between the elements of the uh, Article 50 divorce arrangements and the future relationship. For instance, if the government would state the period of transition it, it seeks and the status in terms of the customs union and the single market, um, and what continuing contributions it proposes to make uh, in respect of that status, then that might facilitate an agreement on the liabilities for the existing commitments. If the government said it wanted to stay in the customs union and the single market, this would, at a stroke, resolve many of the worries over Ireland, which we are in the course of debating this afternoon. So while the uh, government rather goes round in circles, businesses are having to make relocation decisions now, affecting jobs. The pound drops and the economy slows. The government keeps reproaching the EU for not coming up with concrete suggestions for flexible solutions. Um, but if the government cannot specify what end goal it is seeking, how can we expect Brussels to come up with flexibility to fit what the government wants. Um, it's it's catch-22. The customs solutions put forward in the uh, paper about three weeks ago were, were, were suggested to be innovative. Well, they weren't practical or th thought through. And even the uh, Secretary of State has called them blue sky thinking. A mere couple of weeks after the paper was published. So that hardly gives a good, solid basis on which Brussels can engage with these suggestions. So I would like to ask, if the government has a strategy as opposed to a series of delays, reactive statements and outbursts, will it share this strategy with Parliament and the British public? Aren't we and they secondary, in fact, to an audience of the ideologically obsessed hard Brexiteers in the Tory party's own ranks and outside, who, who are not even happy. I see that Aaron Banks is trying to unseat Tory MPs, including uh, Amber Rudd. Perhaps that accounts for the Prime Minister repeating this no deal uh, mantra, which is surely both unhelpful and petulant to raise, even as a possibility, uh, the, the, the chaotic falling off a cliff edge Brexit. So could the government uh, level with Parliament and the public, be honest about the fact that, as we are proposing to leave the EU club, the UK cannot expect to retain the full benefits of club membership. We cannot have our cake while eating it. The fact that they need us as much as we need them is untrue, and we need to compromise. And lastly, that it is up to Britain to set out in detail its preferred destination and how to get there. As one journalist put it, the departing ship is watched by the EU with both sadness and concern, but there is no rush to take on its navigation problems. Please will the government tell us its proposed destination and how it's going to navigate. The strategy of this government is clear, straightforward and pragmatic, and that is to ensure that we build a deep and special partnership with our closest neighbours and allies which are of benefit to the peoples of both the EU27 and the UK 
after we leave. This is indeed the most momentous form of negotiation that I've experienced in my lifetime. It's a privilege to be at the Department of Ex for Exiting the European Union at that stage and to see the hard work that's been going on in order to deliver that path towards a successful legal de decoupling while still remaining closest friends. And considerable progress has been made. I, I do thank both noble ladies for their contributions and their questions, and I will uh, seek to amalgamate my answers to cover those, um, if I may. The nature of negotiation, which has been carried on by this country over centuries, has sometimes varied from being on the battlefield, whether it's in Tudor times, against some of now one of our dearest neighbours, Portugal and Spain, or um, certainly now negotiation is a matter of finding methods of agreement, of convergence, not dictating, of saying we will only agree to this, but setting out reasoned proposals. And that's the work that's been done. There's been, been no delay. The department has been working with other departments across Whitehall to look at the ways in which we can publish our, our proposals, but to give options for the negotiation. And that's very much clear in the customs paper, which proposes two different options. One, a highly streamlined uh, approach, which would ensure that uh, the customs arrangement works as well as can be done with modern technology, another a new customs partnership with the EU. And I, I hear what both noble ladies say with regard to the fact that the Secretary of State has pointed out there are problems in some of those, because there are always problems in finding new ways to deliver customs agreements. But they're not insuperable, and that's why the negotiations uh, at the pace has been deep and fast, and clearly both uh, Michel Barnier and we have made it clear that we are ready to make even more dates available for negotiations if that is helpful. Because we do want to continue to make the progress that already has been achieved. But there is much more to be done. That's absolutely right. Noble Lady Lady Hayter referred to the Irish Minister saying that the Northern Ireland papers need a lot of work. We, we agree. But we also say, and they agree, we have made great progress and we have uh, received clearly congratulations on from, from Ireland about the progress that has been made. Um, and my Lords, the summer papers, as I say, are not vague. What they do is to provide a basis for negotiation, not for dictation. And my Lords, uh, with regard to the question Noble Baroness Lady Hayter asked on transitional agreement and implementation, what is our position? Our position is set out clearly in that we appreciate from having all, carried out all the consultation we've done with business, with consumers, uh, broadly, not only those businesses based here, but those are international, we appreciate that there could be different lengths of time that different organisations and businesses need to achieve the movement to a new relationship with the EU. And therefore, it's only by carrying out our negotiations with the European Union on our future relationship that one can then finalise how long that implementation period would be. But we've been clear, we've made it clear that we do not see that going, we will not go beyond the date of the next election. And with regard to the specific question, Noble Lady, Lady Hayter, Baroness Lady Hayter asked about public treasury analysis. These are not matters that are usually published. They are for government use, but I have uh, made it clear before that uh, we have carried out analysis of, uh, indeed, over 50 sectors, and we will be publishing the list of what those sectors comprise. And we continue to consult business and consumers, and I'm very pleased that I'm able to be part of that. Uh, my Lords, with regard to the devolved administrations, throughout we've made it clear that it's utterly essential that the devolved administrations are engaged at every stage. And whether it's a JMC, and the next one is indeed in October, or whether it is personal, uh, person to personal phone calls, visits as carried out by uh, my honourable friend Robin Walker this summer, those continue to devolved administrations. And indeed, Robin Walker visited uh, the Crown Dependencies as well. My Lords, it's not a matter of leaving it for meetings, it's a continuing conversation. And my Lords, throughout all this process, uh, we really want to be in a position where in setting out in our papers 
the implications of leaving the European Union but maintaining a strong trading relationship, that we enable both us and the EU27 to avoid running negotiations twice. The noble Baroness Lady Loveford particularly referred to this and asked a question. So did it mean that we would be staying in the customs union, the single market, in the implementation period? My Lords, that's not the answer to having a, a, a transition and implementation period. We are seeking a negotiation to see what that particular period would look like. It doesn't mean that you stay in the single market with all the ceding of the right to, give, uh, to make decisions to others over your destiny. My Lords, with regard to the matter of uh, the principle of financial liabilities, the Noble Baroness Lady Ludford, uh, I believe, said that that has now been challenged. Our principles have been challenged, or challenged the principle of it. No, we have not. We have maintained the fact that we accept that there is not only a legal basis for um, both the EU and we having to ensure that there are liabilities that need to be met, but also there is a moral responsibility. And my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, made that absolutely clear in his uh, press conference last week with Michel Barnier, and we will maintain that. But we don't hand the keys of the Treasury to the Commission. What we do on a friendly but rigorous basis is to work through with them, challenging the legal basis, but also, beyond that, the calculation of how and what should be paid, but also, my lords, when, because that, again, is woven into the nature of our future, rela future relationship with the European Union. My lords, it is the case that this has been a hard-working summer for all. I don't believe peers simply disappear into the ether and do nothing, and I know that many noble lords have already read the papers and discussed with them. And may I put on record my particular thanks to the noble Baroness Lady Hayter, the noble Baroness Lady Ludford, and also the leader of the cross benches, Lord Hope of Craighead, for agreeing to have conversations with me uh, during the summer recess on these matters. My Lord, it's only by doing that that we can deliver what this country needs. I um, very strongly welcome this statement, and I particularly welcome the stream of position papers that have come out throughout July. I think we've hardly had time to, to read all of them. The volume has been so great. But they do set out extremely clearly, much more clearly than has been given credit in this, uh, in, in this House or elsewhere, the, um, the aims and objectives of um, Her Majesty's Government in reaching agreements, constructive agreements, with the, uh, with continental, with the rest of Europe. Um, w would she agree in particular that the concept of customs partnership, which is developed in one of the recent papers, is really a vast improvement on, the, on being tied to the outdated customs union, um, which is a, a design of the 20th century and hardly fits into the modern pattern of trade at all, but which the opposition has suddenly decided to cling to for reasons which I can't fully understand, but perhaps they can be explained. Could, could I ask for one more position paper? in the stream that I know some more are coming, could I ask for one in particular, uh, which concentrates on the <coughs> thoughts and contribution that Britain might make to the overall fundamental reform of European cooperation and the modernization of the whole EU model, which is so obviously needed as the European continent as a whole faces colossal new challenges, notably uh, migration and refugees, but many other challenges as well. We need an entirely new pattern of cooperation to meet the 20th century in Europe, and through our deep and special relationship, we can make that contribution. Could we have that set out as well as the other ideas that have already been presented to us? Yeah. My noble friend, as ever, speaks from great experience in these matters, and I'm very interested in his proposal about a paper looking at uh, further EU reform about the new pa pattern of cooperation. And, and I recall in our years in opposition together as well, listening to him um, examining uh, in, in a very intellectual way 
how we could uh, in fact change the way that the EU worked for the better of all. Now, I'm very interested and in, I will certainly take that idea back. My Lords, I agree with him that customs partnership is better than the customs union because a customs union in itself means that one is not in a position to carry out trade deals. My Lords, the Department of International Trade is ready, willing and very able to carry out those deals and earlier on the noble lady, Lady Hayter, seemed to think that they didn't, they lacked capacity but my Lords, since its formation, DIT has increased to a global world workforce of over 3,200. The trade policy group has quadrupled in size and in June 2017 the department appointed a new chief trade um, uh, negotiations advisor with over 25 years ex of experience. But my laws, I, I was a little bit cheeky there because what I really want to do is to add on the record my thanks to my noble friend Lord Price. It has been an absolute joy to be able to work with him over the last year and, quarter, a year and a quarter. I was very keen on his appointment because before that, for one month only, I'm pleased to say, I was also trade minister while doing the work at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. He was superb. My Lords, thank the lady, noble lady for the statement she made. Uh, it does seem to me to show that her right honourable friend in the other place has learnt the good old American advertising adage that when you have a fairly dodgy product, you must accentuate the positive. Uh, but could I put two questions, please? Uh, firstly, uh, on this question of jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, the paper that the government has put on the table and which was uh, referred to by the noble lady um, is interesting. Uh, it's a piece of uh, rather academic research on the possibilities, but it doesn't say a single word about which the government's preferences are amongst those options. Uh, it invents a rather peculiar concept, which is indirect jurisdiction, if I understand it rightly, because I assume that the opposite of direct jurisdiction is indirect jurisdiction, uh, which is apparently not so a rebarbative as direct jurisdiction, but perhaps you could say something about the government's preferences amongst those choices. And the second question I'd like to ask her is if she could say a little bit more about the implications of the uh, government's support for the idea of some uh, transitional period uh, after March 19, 2019, the implications of that for the budgetary issues which are causing so much trouble now. Uh, it would strike me, uh, not being all that arithmetically advanced, uh, that in fact if we stayed effectively amongst in, in, in many of the workings of the European Union, not in the European Union, for a transitional period, that might make quite a big difference to the way that the financial issues would be handled. Perhaps you could confirm that that would be so. My Lords, with regard to the first question about the Court of Justice of the European Union, the reason why we set out options without saying which was the one we were going to come down firmly in favour was because we were putting forward options for discussion on the basis that, uh, as I said earlier, in discussions you scope out where there can be some early agreement and build upon that. But with regard to the particular question about indirect jurisdiction, which the noble lord, of course, is right to raise, um, I would just, um, of course, uh, add that there are areas where the Court of Justice of the European Union will continue to have some indirect jurisdiction after we leave the European Union if there is an agreement as it is currently developing uh, with regard to pending cases at the uh, court itself. So there is already built into the current structure of the withdrawal bill and the negotiations some uh, room where there would be indirect jurisdiction, but indirect jurisdiction is not one which would change the law in this United Kingdom or direct us how to change the law. And that, in there, that lies the difference. With regard to transitional period on the matter of budgetary issues, um, of course the multi-annual financial framework of 2013 does indeed apply between 2014 and 2020. And therefore what we are doing in challenging the paper which was put out by the European Union is to see where there are, um, uh, where there are where there is a basis for saying that there are uh, uh, duties upon the UK to continue paying 
beyond 2019, wherever the date may be of leaving, and when there are not. So although I can't uh, at this stage answer Noble Law directly, he raises the important issue that we're trying to flesh out in the way that we are challenging the basis on which the European Union has said that it has not only a legal basis for claiming contributions from this country to the EU, but also, my lords, we do need to look during those negotiations at the liabilities of the EU to the UK. Earlier on in the House, in the course of the um, Ireland debate this afternoon, as saying that the best practical outcome to which we could realistically aspire was hard Brexit. Did he say that, or something along those lines? If so, what did he mean by it, and is that position of the government? I can't say that I heard him say that, but I have heard him say time and time again, uh, as he did indeed on the Mar show on Sunday, is quite simply, he doesn't go into talking about hard Brexit or soft Brexit, neither do I. We both want a uh, successful one for this country and the EU. Noble Lady's answer to Lady Hayter's question about the devolved administrations. I think I heard her say that the JMCEN, the Ministerial Committee set up with the devolved administrations, to coordinate Brexit positions will meet next month. Is that true? Excellent. I'm delighted to hear it. Why has it not met since February? <laughs> Why were these ten papers, these ten little essays, sent out in the summer? Why were none of them seen in draft by the devolved administrations? Why did they not see in draft the only serious negotiating paper the government has put forward, which was the interesting paper on citizens' rights? And why is the government so determined systematically to break the promises given to the devolved administrations of close consultation. And while she's at it, could the lady give us an example, please, of a successful money negotiation where one of the parties to the negotiation refused to put forward any numbers? My Lords, the European Union has not put forward any numbers. It is a negotiation, my Lords, I would like to say, it is a good-natured negotiation. And that, there are, clearly there are um, occasions in the press when people uh, like to take certain positions, but those who are negotiating know each other, work well with each other, and want to come to a result that's good for all of us. Uh, my Lords, with regard to the devolved administrations, there has been continuous conversation, not only between ministers, but between officials too where so much of the detailed technical work can be done. And that will continue. I, uh, as soon as I was appointed, I did in fact have uh, one of the parallel uh, meetings that happened with the devolved administrations, uh, which is the, the general uh, committee that meets about Europe, not about the negotiations. And my lords, that was a privilege to be able to talk to representatives of uh, Scotland and Wales. And of course, it's a disappointment we're not able to talk directly to representatives yet Northern Ireland until the executive issue is resolved. The noble Baroness has given the impression that uh, there is complete amity between uh, Her Majesty's Government uh, and uh, the uh, Welsh Assembly in relation to um, all aspects of Brexit. The reports emanating from Cardiff seem to differ, and indeed um, the impression given by Mr. Caroline Jones, the First Minister for Wales, is that indeed Wales is treated with a lofty disdain in the matter. Those are my words, not his, but I think uh, that was the description that most clearly he has given. Who is right in this matter, if you please? But, sir, nobody in this government would treat any member of the Welsh Government with lofty disdain and has not, and uh, indeed the leader of the Welsh Government has not made such an accusation. The devolved administrations have, albeit in the history of this country, a short history, but it is a very honourable one. There are matters that, have, uh, that are devolved to them which they carry out punctiliously. Sometimes, of course, it can be bumpy, as in all political life, and they get taken to task by their voters. My Lords, we recognise fully the importance of engaging with them, and my Lords, we will continue to do so. Well, lady suggested, or oh, in reading out the statement from the Secretary of State, that we have been clear that the EU and the UK will have financial obligations to each other that will survive our exit from the European Union. In July, the Commission set out the EU position 
We have a duty to our taxpayers to interrogate that position rigorously. That is what we did line by line. Now, my Lords, the noble lady suggested that the European Commission had not put forward any numbers. What on earth has been discussed line by line? Um, is this all fantasy? Uh, the, the noble lady is right, of course, to pursue that matter, what has been discussed. Well, there was a three and a half, I think, the three hour presentation by the UK technical group challenging line by line the treaty basis, so the various regulations, directives, uh, all of which were listed on the paper to which uh, Monsieur Barnier referred in last week's uh, press conference. Um, indeed, at that, I, I believe I heard him to say that the Commission had given a link in of the legal basis for all on that list. In fact, that wasn't quite accurate. There are two where there is a, a no reference in that published list. So that's what we are testing. And the Commission goes back and looks at the exact wording of the treaty. What we're saying is one needs to look at also how does that attack applied to people as well. But we're also challenging the legal basis itself. Can the noble Baroness confirm uh, that the EU side are continuing to insist that EU citizens in the UK after Brexit should continue to have the same free movement rights as they have now, guaranteed by the European Court of Justice? And if so, does she recognise that this would put EU citizens in a position of having much better rights in regard to uh, bringing uh, spouses and relatives and dependent relatives into the UK, much better rights than British citizens. And does the government agree, <coughs> believe that this could remotely be acceptable to the public uh, uh, or in indeed feasible? Yeah. The, the noble lord is right in his uh, presumption that uh, currently the, uh, the, Europe, the Commission is uh, saying that the European Union citizens who remain here should have better rights of, uh, of bringing family members in in the future than would be available to British citizens. But my Lords, again, this is an area where we are um, looking very carefully at the detail because clearly what we have done is to try to ensure that families who are here at the time of leaving can be sure that they can continue to operate as a family. It's a matter of how you define that, and that's what our paper was doing earlier this year. And my lawyers, I can say to the noble lord, we are looking very carefully at these issues because it is important that overall people should be able to get on with their lives. And my goodness, they can be so complicated. Our family structures are so different and etiolated these days that it does take a lot of technical detail to be able to discuss how to resolve a way forward for both of us. My Lords, may I raise a, a technical economic rather than a political point? It is a reality that a pound or a euro today is worth more than a pound or a euro in a year's time. And in looking at these complex financial arrangements with regard to the exit payments and so on, we really need to agree one, what we are going to use in the negotiations as the base date, and two, and very importantly, what the rate of discount, the allowance for the value of uh, time value of money is. And uh, unless we agree on those two points, uh, the figures are going to be very, very difficult indeed to reconcile. So I believe my, my noble friend has made a, a very valid point, and one of, um, and he certainly has much better uh, experience in these matters than I. And I, I'm aware that the Treasury were well represented at the discussions last week, uh, and uh, I will ensure that I, I bring his comments to their view. And my lords, I'm also aware that the paper which was issued by the European Commission uh, required that any monies paid by the UK to the EU should be in euros. Uh, avoid the observation that strong and stable has now been replaced by deep and special. Uh, if deep and special is the objective, then clearly foreign affairs, defence, security and exchange of intelligence will be very important components of that relationship. I don't, within the four corners of this statement, see any reference to these matters. Are they being discussed and to what extent? 
absolutely right. And uh, future papers will come out, I can assure him of that. This is not the sum total, there, there, there are more coming. But discussions uh, have been held across government about how we would be able to take forward the, particularly, of course, the, uh, the matter of uh, common defence and security policy, how that is to, to be fleshed out. What we want to be able to do is to show not only that we want to continue the cooperation that we have, uh, but we want to strengthen and deepen that as well. So, uh, my lords, uh, uh, I hope that uh, the noble lord will not have to wait too long to be able to see some better information than I've given in that snapshot. <laughs>